But anyway, it is just, I've been looking forward to this uh, ever since we uh, uh, arranged this meeting. It is a real pleasure uh, to have Mary Roach with us as our speaker. Um, if I think everyone here is familiar with it, her, but just to give a little background, uh, she's written, I believe it's seven best-selling uh, nonfiction books about all the type of stuff you always wondered about, uh, but didn't dare ask. And she has a just wicked sense of humor in writing about it. And uh, she wrote the book, uh, which maybe for a group like Sisters in Crime is the one that's most on point called Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers. Uh, she's also written the book Spook, Science Tackles the Afterlife, Bonk about human sexuality and science, Gulp about the alimentary canal, uh, Grunt about science of humans at war, and most recently, and a book that had great interest to me because of my close encounters with bears on my motorcycle, uh, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. Uh, just to give you an idea, we can't go through every all of her honors, but just for Fuzz, which came out in 2021, it was on the New York Times Editor's Choices list, the Washington Post Notable Books of 2021 list. Goodreads Choice Award Finals, NPR 2021 Best Books, New York Public Library 2021 Best Books, Smithsonian 10 Best Science Books of 2021, uh, Library Journal's Best Books of 2021, Science Friday's Best Bo Science Books of 2021, Okay, enough. Bloomberg's, <laughs> Bloomberg's 15 Best Nonfiction Books of 2021. Uh, the list goes on. And maybe most Notably, her 2009 talk on 10 things you didn't know about orgasms made uh, the TED's uh, list of most popular TED talks of all time. So it is just a pleasure to have with us Mary Roach. Thanks for well, being with us today. Um, well, thank you, Stephen, for that marvelous and embarrassing <laughs> introduction. <laughs> well, I didn't. I didn't mention the award that you won for some category where you're the only entry, but that was that's yeah. an aside. Yeah, Can that's you, my that's uh, my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Since we are uh, the way I we discussed doing this is more as a conversation than some sort of a presentation. Um, yeah. Can you just start by a little bit by telling uh, telling our group about your background? Sure. Uh, um, I. I write about science, but I, I, I didn't major in science. I didn't uh, even really think of myself as someone who was interested in science uh, when I was in high school and college. So <clears throat> it's something that happened uh, uh, gradually. I, uh, I graduated in the middle of a recession in 1981, and uh, I, I didn't have a lot of job skills. I had a, you know, a BA in psychology. So I, uh, I thought, well, what can I do? Well, I can string some words together. <laughs> so I, I, uh, my early work was working for public affairs departments, you know, publicity and public affairs for uh, some nonprofits, the San Francisco Zoological Society and the San Francisco's, uh, and the San Francisco SPCA. And those were writing jobs. And so uh, I got a taste for uh, writing uh, <clears throat> and I enjoyed it. And both of those jobs enabled me to kind of cover sort of quirky things that uh, I got a kick out of. Like, this, you know, I'd, I'd be assigned to cover, uh, I remember an elephant was getting laser uh, wart removal surgery. <clears throat> there was a plantar wart on its foot. And so I got to observe the surgery and write about that for the membership magazine of the Zoological Society. And so I, that's sort of how I came to writing. I didn't write for the college newspaper or um, do any kind of writing prior to that, but I did enjoy it. And I really had no, I had no other job skills. So I had to pay the rent. And uh, so writing, uh, that's, that's what I ended up doing. And then for, from there, from, from public affairs type writing, I uh, started freelancing for the San Francisco Examiner and Chronicle Sunday Magazine 
uh, that was just something that came about by querying them, sending a, a pitch letter. And uh, back then it was on paper in an envelope with, you know, uh, you send clips of your writing, although I didn't have much early on. Uh, and some editor took a chance on me and said, sure. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot. They weren't having to spend a lot of money on taking a chance on me. And uh, so uh, I ended up writing for them and then an editor. What happened a lot back in the days of freelance magazine writing when magazines you know, were thriving is that editors would make their way up the food chain and I would follow them. So, you know, an editor would go from uh, outside magazine to from wired to outside to the New York Times magazine. So you have these relationships with editors and, and you maintain them and kind of ride on ride along on the coattails. So uh, I from from that I ended up writing for national uh, a number of national magazines. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I did that very happily for for many years, uh, probably uh, my all the way through my 30s. Uh, 20s and 30s but was was magazine writing so it took me a while to to write books and that came out of a um a connection and an agent contacted me uh, uh he'd read a few of my i was writing a column for salon.com which was an early internet internet magazine that funny to think that that was an exciting thing back in 1999 uh, so he contacted me and said have you thought about books and we went back and forth and uh, he encouraged me to write the proposal for Stiff. So that's how it happened. So how did you get an interest, did you move toward an interest in science uh, before writing Stiff or did it just oh, come out sorry, of that? Yeah, book? that's kind of what you asked, wasn't it, science? <laughs> um, yeah. That happened because um, the, the editor that left uh, image, the magazine of the Chronicle Examiner, she went to this magazine called Hippocrates, which was a very good um, magazine about health and medicine, and it was for the general public, and it was, it was, it was a good magazine. It got a number of National Magazine Awards, and so at, at one point, um, and I enjoyed those pieces a lot. I enjoyed writing for them. I became a contributing editor for them. And uh, the editor, the editor, an editor at Discover Magazine had seen a piece I wrote for them and contacted me about writing for them. And Discover, of course, is a science magazine. So uh, those two magazines were the ones that I enjoyed writing for most. Um, you know, I, I wrote for other magazines, GQ, Vogue, some travel magazines. But, uh, but the stories that really interested me and that I really enjoyed the most were for those two publications, which were science and medicine. So is that something, uh, since this is a group of writers here, or would-be writers, is that something that you actively pursued that course, or did it just fall to you? Oh, it was very much uh, one thing leading to another. You know, I, it was quite, I, I didn't pursue it, no. I mean, I uh, the editor contacted me from Discover Magazine. Um, I never set out to write about science. No, I, I didn't. Uh, I just once once I did a story for them and um, enjoyed it, I, you know, I did more stories for them. And, and then when the uh, salon.com started, uh, I suggested a column that had to do with health and medicine and the human body. Uh, so that that was my suggestion. But by and large, it, it was something I stumbled into. I didn't have a, a course, a plan, a career plan, <laughs> anything like that. So with the first book, and correct me if I'm wrong with any of these things I, I say, but the first book I think was Stiff. Yes, that's correct. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about, uh, and maybe you didn't have to do this, but I'm thinking about one, how do you come up with this idea of writing about what happens to cadavers? And I, I guess it's in the nature of a writer. You sit there, how in the hell do you pitch that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, stiff, uh, I'll tell you how stiff happened. Um, I was writing the salon column and um, I, 
tend to poke around for ideas. I used to anyway. I, I like to go into the parts of libraries. And this was a medical school library at UCSF. And in the basement, there are a lot of old books that no one looks at anymore. And I find them fascinating. And there was a range of, there was a bunch of um, bound journals. That was the proceedings of the STAP car crash conference. And this was a, uh, <clears throat> the car crash conference was a, this was the beginnings of automotive safety research. It was the first time anybody looked at cars as um, not nifty, hot looking modes of transportation, but as the um, ca uh, causers of death and injury and pain. And so the, the early days of automotive safety, there was an effort to <clears throat> um, design a crash test dummy. And that in order to, to make the measurements that the dummy recorded meaningful, you needed to know what happened. What do these forces do to an actual body? So cadavers were used. Uh, in that work. And I wrote about that. And um, around that time, an ag this agent contacted me and he said, look at your hit rates for your column. Go on and see which ones are the mo uh, most people seem to be interested in. And that column, as well as another one I wrote about um, how much you could eat before your stomach bursts. And this was for Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, the, there were a couple of cadaver studies back in the 1800s, I think it was uh, uh, mid 1800s that had that, that were trying to answer this question. So those two cadaver related columns had high hit rates. And he said, well, you should think about a book. And I remember thinking that's a terrible idea. Who goes in <laughs> to a bookstore, looks at the table of new nonfiction and goes, oh yeah, this book about cadavers and how they're used. Uh, that's going to be my next read. I mean, to me, it seemed like a terrible idea, but uh, I didn't have anything else in my back pocket. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll look into it a bit more. And then I got interested more and I wrote a couple pages up and, and, you know, I have to really credit him because he kind of, you know, he said, you know, he didn't say write a book proposal because that's quite an undertaking. He said, just write up a couple pages, almost like a treatment and show it to me. And I did. And then he said, I, I really think you have something here and you should you know, write a proposal. And he sent me a couple sample proposals, although they weren't at all similar to what I was doing and weren't terribly helpful. I think the message was there is no model for this. Just it's a sales pitch. So make it as interesting as you can. Uh, anyway, so I did that. I wrote a proposal and we had a number of people uh, bidding on this rather strange Topic. Part of this, part of it also, I think I, I, I had a sense for many years that everything had already been written about. There was a book about everything. I found it very hard to come up with something that felt fresh and that hadn't been written about in book form. And uh, by golly, nobody had written a book about <laughs> how cadavers have been made themselves useful in history and present day. So it did seem that I had that field to myself, <laughs> kind it, of the it's bottom feeder. It's it struck me as reading it and, and he, you know, the, from the first chapter, you're sitting there with 27 heads in a, in a room and people get, and yet I found myself and I don't laugh out loud, especially at books. I don't laugh out loud at movies very often, but I actually laughed out loud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did, did the, did the, the, as I, I described it, and it's the only way I can, is a wicked sense of humor. Did that come out in your earlier writings, or is that something you just you developed for stiff? Because I will tell you, I, I mean, I, I don't think you could deal with that topic for that many pages without yeah. humor lightening the, the approach to it. Yeah, um, it wasn't, uh, I didn't, see humor as a as a technique for that book although i think that you're right it did make that book easier for people to get through and and more appealing um but it's something i always wrote that way M my magazine pieces had a similar sensibility and tone um and i actually worried that that kind of humor combined with this subject matter was a mistake and that people would be upset by it or 
offended if they maybe had lost a loved one. So I did, I was kind of uh, concerned that that wasn't the best way to do it. It's the only way I know how to do things. It's just me, it's my approach. It's how I see the world and how I approach these research trips. And, and um, I, so I've just figured, well, I'll let the editor take things out if she thinks they're inappropriate. And she left most everything in. So we just tossed it out into the world and crossed our fingers. Did did you have reactions from your friends and others when you when they say, "Oh, you're working <laughs> on a book. What's it about?" Yes, I I remember distinctly being at a party, I, um, in San Francisco, and um, this woman, we don't need to name her. She said, "Oh, come on, you're among friends." <laughs> her name was Bonnie Fluke. So she said, "Oh, you're writing a book. What's it about?" And I told her, and she said in a very snide way, let me ask you something. Who's gonna buy that book? <laughs> and I really couldn't help but feel that she was probably right. I, I couldn't answer that. I don't know who's gonna buy that book. Um, so yeah, I, you, you know, it's, um, I sometimes hear from readers who say, um, people look at me funny when I'm reading this book or if I talk about this book and, and I say, well, how do you think it felt to write the thing? So. I, I definitely did feel, uh, you know, I think for the most part, you hear from people who, who liked the book and the people who think that it's uh, too strange or in some way not to their liking, they don't usually take the time to write to you. So I didn't, I didn't get a lot of, I didn't get a lot of negative feedback. I mean, this was before social media, keep in mind, but um, I think that the, the cover and the title kind of self-select the readership. You know, it's clear that it's, you know, the stiff, the, it's not a textbook. It's not a touchy feely book. It's a little irreverent. Um, I, so uh, that may have helped, but I, I didn't, I really didn't get a lot of, uh, unless I'm blocking it from my memory. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't get a lot of negative feedback on it. It, it was, it was definitely something I, had been concerned about as the book came out. Hey, well, hey Steve, I, I, Steve, Steve, yes. Steve, do you mind? I, I had a really, I had a question about this. Who came up with the title, Stiff? That was my next question. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I did. I came up with the title, Stiff, and then great. I want- It's great. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, I stupidly tried to convince them to ch that it wasn't a good title because I, I, this is how you never, never listen to authors when it comes to covers and titles because I I didn't want either one I mean I now think the both are fine but the cover um, I felt was too derivative of six feet under which was just pop, very popular right around the time the book came out and the and the title I thought well nobody in the world of cadaver research calls cadaver stiffs that's definitely a city morgue um, crime type of t word stiff you know we got a stiff over here charlie <laughs> you know i so i i and, and my editor wisely said you are overthinking this um a stiff is a body and that's good enough and it's a you know it's a good it's a good title word so um i've of course come around to seeing it that way but it's just funny that i this was that i was concerned that that was uh not the best title. i don't think that i i think I, you know i had, didn't have anything better up my sleeve so um, well, Steve, the, Steve, I'm sorry, titles. just one more second. Can I, can I just jump in one more time? I just, I'm reading this book and I, I think this is the most brilliant opening to um, a nonfiction story I've ever read. The human head is of the same approximate size and weight as a roaster chicken. <laughs> I never, I have never before had occasion to make the comparison for never before today have I seen a head in a roasting pan, but here are 40 of them. I'm, I'm just like, just that whole, I'm never going to eat chicken the same way again. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I just had to, that is just a great opening. Thank you so much. You know, I think- How, did, how did you come up with, how did, how did you come to write that? Well, my, my training in, in magazine writing, um, uh, caused me to 
fret excessively about opening lines and opening paragraphs. Uh, so each chapter felt, each chapter, book chapter to me feels like the beginning of a magazine piece, even though they're, you know, they're connected and I very much hope that they don't feel like disjointed magazine articles. I, I tend to feel like the opening of a new so, you know, to, I, I'm changing scenes. It's it's a noose and I've got to introduce people and I've got to get them. In. You've got to, you know, you've got very little real estate to pull the person into your story. That's what you're trained as a magazine feature writer that you've got um, really a couple sentences to catch their eye and, and to catch their interest. And so I'm, I've always um, spent a lot of time on an opening paragraph. And it also, for me, just feels like it sets up once I get that and I down and I like it, it kind of sets the stage and I feel like, oh, I'm, I'm practically done. Now I just write the chapter. So, so it has to feel like a setup and it's very, you know, when you have it and I may spend two days <laughs> and then, you know, throw away everything I wrote and um, end up using the second paragraph. But um, I, um, I think it was in that case, that scene walking into that lab where these plastic and reconstructive surgeons were about to get to work, you know, it, it had been set up and they hadn't, they hadn't arrived yet. I was the first one there, one of the first ones there. So to see these heads, um, I mean, it's an unforgettable image just to see, you know, the human head, um, because that's where you, you know, that's the, where the personality resides, the face, the head, the brain, uh, to see that severed <laughs> in a roasting pan was such a bizarre um, kind of unsettling memorable sight that I I knew that that would be that that was how to grab people's attention and and pull them into the in this case the book so um, you know you you definitely with a book you know you know and you know that when somebody opens a book in a bookstore uh, that those first sentences are important so uh, you you know you want it to be as as uh, arresting as you can make it, and uh, that that so that's that's why the heads landed there. So in your writing process, is that first sentence of the the book, that first sentence of the paragraph, is that something that you sit there and that is the first thing you write, or is it something that you? will write out what you're going to say and then go back to and know that you've got to write that kicker right at the beginning. Um, I, I always, I spend a fair amount of time on it right in the beginning because it, for me, it helps me just get rolling on the chapter. Um, that process, you're going through all of your notes kind of nominating thing, like what would, you know, what here in all of my transcripts of interviews and all of my notes of where I've been and everything I have, what's the best stuff, you know? So you're going through, so in, in that process of going through everything, you're reacquainting yourself with what material you have and you're kind of forming a sense of what will be the narrative structure for this chapter and where will I go and what are the best bits? So it's, a, it's an important process, not just for getting the first line, or first few lines, but just to re-familiarize myself with that material, because it may have been a while since I reported that chapter. Uh, so it is the first thing I, I do. In fact, the, the, the heads in the roaster pans are, are not the first uh, line of the book. They're the first line of the first chapter, but there's an introduction um, before that. Um, so I do, you know, I do that every chapter. I do try to uh, have a a, you know, a, an opening that feels satisfying to me. And it's a process I enjoy as a writer. I, I like that uh, challenge of setting up what's to come in a way that whets the appetite for the reader. Well, you we enjoy. Have, yeah. Oh, thank you. You know, you don't have to do that. It. I mean, you, uh, don't, uh, you know, a narrative f fiction doesn't have that kind of kicker opening for, um, you know, it's it's not something people always do it's it's i think partly because i enjoy it i i always try to do it so the, back to the to the process i know we're focusing a lot on stiff because i think in part because for our group this is sort of a manual because of the type of mystery sure. stories crime stories we write but um do you write 
a chapter at a time. For example, do you go out and research a chapter and then write the chapter and then go out and research and write another chapter? Or do you do it all at once? Because the writing that most of us do in this group, you know, we sit down and we may have an outline, some don't, and just write from beginning to end. You can't just like pick out a chapter and write it as a standalone yeah. type thing. So yeah, I, what uh, process yeah. do you follow? Um, I, I don't do all the research first. I, as soon as I have everything I think that I'm gonna need for a chapter, I, I try to write, write it that for a couple of reasons. One, it's fresh in my mind. Uh, and also I just, um, I like the feeling of written pages piling up. You know, if I, if I have a huge stack of research material and nothing written, that feels very daunting. Um, you know, to, to try to keep that all in your head and think about how you're going to arrange it. I mean, the downside of, to what I do is that I don't know the order of the chapters. So uh, I frequently have to finagle, you know, I'll have to change the ending of a chapter to set up the coming chapter a little bit better. So, so you know, you, you, you definitely have to massage it a bit when you do figure out where it's going to go. And sometimes I know, okay, I know these three chapters are going to follow, boom, boom, boom. So I'll write that whole chunk uh, if I have that material. <clears throat> so um, uh, yeah, that's a, um, I, I simply couldn't face the challenge of, of a whole year and a half's worth of <laughs> researching uh, all that material that it, that's gathered um, waiting to be written is just um, uh, very off-putting for me. But I know plenty of uh, nonfiction writers who do that and certainly um, fiction. You know, you with fiction <clears throat> and with um, more narrative nonfiction where you have a, a, a single arc and a set of characters throughout the book, I think you almost have to have all the research done because then otherwise you don't know the pacing. You don't know how much time to spend on this particular chunk if you don't know what the overall picture is. Uh, so it's probably harder to do with the kind of writing that you guys do. I had a different question on my little outline here, but what you brought up uh, sort of moves me in another direction, which is all of your books have been science related. The <laughs> ones that have been books, I, you know, have you ever thought about writing a novel? Uh, and, you know, like Andy Weir has done, you know, turn science into his yeah. The Martian and, and Hail Mary, and there have been other writers who've done it. And, and you write so well, and <laughs> just so, I mean, we keep people's attention in classes, which a lot of people slept through when they were in school, and you keep people turn, as a page turner. Uh, have you ever thought about turning your, your talents to, uh, to fiction and trying that direction? I, I've thought about it, um, but I just don't, I don't think I would be particularly good at it. I read fiction and I marvel at the way people are building something with um, mostly just their imagination. Certainly a lot of research goes into good fiction. Um, whether it's historical fiction or, or whatever it's based on, uh, there's, there's often a lot of research that's done, but still the, the, the characters and the motivations and the, and the dialogue and, and the movements of the plot are all coming from um, one's own imagination. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, so I rely on the crutch of reality. You know, I, well, number one, it's, it's something that makes it easier for me because I, I gather this pile of sticks and then I'm like, what's the best thing I can build with what I have? And for me, it would be kind of a, um, I just peril, I'd be paralyzed with all the possibilities of where, where you could go with it. How do you ever decide? So I just don't, I don't think I'd be that good at it, number one. And also I think I so enjoy um, the travel and the, the, you know, going out into the world and, and spending time with people uh, as they do their jobs and their, their work, I, I would miss that. I mean, you know, you could do that, but um, it's expensive what I do. And I uh, rely on the advances to, to fund 
the you know the travel and sometimes I have to hire an interpreter and um, so I would miss I would miss the 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 researching but I also just don't honestly don't think I'd 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 be very good at it. So what has been uh, what well, one question I had that. Uh, before we get to this, uh, you're, we talked about the title for Stiff, and that was followed up by Spook and Bonk and Gulp and Grunt and Fuzz. Uh, a couple of others were, had three word titles. Uh, but did when you came up with Stiff, did you envision that as, oh, I can do this one and I can do this one and I can do this one and a, a continuing line of books? with those type of titles or did you know you just wait and see how that first one worked out and then you went from there uh the latter <clears throat> yeah no i i didn't have a plan to uh keep doing one word titles and for for all of the books we considered um titles that had more than one word uh we just didn't find uh didn't find uh, one in the case of packing for Mars, three words, nine so packing for packing for Mars, four syllables. I didn't, couldn't find uh, a good word for that suggested what the book was about, and neither could my agent or my uh, editor or anybody else at the publishing house or anybody I knew. So we went with packing for Mars uh, because there wasn't one word. I mean, there by that time because we'd done there. I think that was the third. Was that my third book? It was the fourth. Uh, we, you know, there was a sense that, oh, we have a pattern here, we should maybe stick to it. But there was never uh, a hard and fast rule. It was just it kind of happened organically. And then we thought, well, maybe we should stick with those because it's kind of my brand now. But we just couldn't come up with anything for packing for Mars. And for Fuzz, my, uh, the title I, I had on the book was Animal Vegetable Criminal. And that is the title still in the UK. <laughs> I, I, that's a title I prefer, but the problem in that case was that um, before the before we went to press, um, the New York Times food writer Mark Bittman published a history of food called Animal Vegetable Junk, and my publisher felt that the title was so close that people would get confused by it on Amazon, or that they'd think I got the idea from him. Um, uh, so because his book came out right around the time the pre-publication marketing stuff was going on and, and the, the um, sales reps from W.W. Norton were talking to people in the bookstores and the buyers in bookstores and they just felt it was too confusing. So um, I was very excited about having nine whole syllables in my, in my title just to sh shake things up a bit. I, I like the animal vegetable. Criminal. Uh, a criminal title. I think that's great. I, yeah, but, I do uh, yeah. So which of, of the many books you've written, which was the most fun to do? The fun to research? Mm. Fun um, to write? Fun to, well, Bach was a lot of fun to write because I had a lot of fun material because bringing human beings into a laboratory and having them do sexual things is just a delightfully awkward <laughs> undertaking. <laughs> especially historically. So that I had just a tremendous amount of fun material for that one. But the, but the, I, recent, if I can hear, sure. If I can just interrupt you, I'm organized a, a big conference for the state bar association for years. And we thought we had a real winner with the year we had the conference in Bloomington at I, Indiana university. And we yes. had the Kinsey Institute as our evening speakers. And oh, perfect. It was a perfect judgment that you can make sex boring. <laughs> I have so, to say, the Kinsey Institute would not allow me into their archives to research what I wanted to research. Turned me down. Really? Yes, they didn't feel that I was legitimate. Or, or I'm not sure exactly what. Well, I wanted to, to view what they refer to as the Kinsey Stag films, which is um, films Kinsey made in his attic. I mean, he was really the first to document the whole sexual response cycle. Masters and Johnson got the funding and published the book and got all the hate mail. But Kinsey was doing it on his own in his attic with his staff. And he filmed things and those films exist. And I wanted, I was curious to see them just to see how were they set up? Did they manage to make them seem like pure science and not porno? <laughs> like, 
How I, I so I, I was really curious, and they were, they said no. I mean, they 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 are protective of Kinsey's legacy, and they. Um, I mean, I I don't I don't entirely blame them. I mean, they probably read one of my books and thought she's not going to treat this with enough. You know, she's not going to be serious enough about this, or or it'll be somehow damaging. They get a lot of hate. The Kinsey, uh, the people who handle Kinsey's legacy. You know, I mean, there are, there are conservatives who basically blame Kinsey for homosexuality because he kind of this expo. You know, he his surveys that he did a lot of surveying of the American population and the the data uh, it was the first time people realized um, that the numbers. And, and, and how prevalent homosexuality was and bisexuality and sex with farm animals and everything else that people were telling Kinsey they did. And so, you know, the, he's, he's hated by a lot of people. So I understand why they're very careful. Um, but anyway, that's too bad that they, <laughs> they were boring. Oh, it was awful. So uh, <laughs> I interrupted your answer, but the, uh, you were talking about doing the research on Bonk. Oh yeah, well, um, as you can imagine, you know, to be a reporter, or, you know, or somebody with a notebook and a tape recorder asking to come into the lab when a researcher has subjects, you know, say masturbating in an uh, MRI tube or or, or uh, uh, who knows what they're doing, but to they you know to have me in the room would invalidate, first of all, it would invalidate their study because I might be affecting how comfortable that person is. And also it was just awkward for the subject of the study. So they, uh, I sometimes just had to be a subject and there's only so many times you can do that before people think you're really weird. <laughs> so uh, that was a challenge. I mean, I remember trying to get my editor to be a subject in a study that was going on at Rutgers. I think it was Rutgers. And, and Jill said, well, Mary, what, what do I have to do? And I said, you, this was the example. I said, I said, well, you just have to, you'll be in an MRI tube and um, you just have to, they're going to be filming your brain. You just have to masturbate. But <laughs> she goes, Mary, I'll, I'll try to get an intern for you. <laughs> she hates when I tell that story. <laughs> Not because of her, but because of the line about the intern. Yeah. You get so in trouble. So I, obviously you have, you've run into stumbling blocks in trying to get, do the research. What, I mean, what stumbling blocks, what has made it difficult to research? What project was the most difficult to write about? Oh, I would say that um, um, the, the, the writing was, you know, uh, um, for me, you know, I have a certain tone, which, <clears throat> is kind of freewheeling and funny. And there's there's times when the subject matter and that tone are at odds. And I would say grunt, um, there were times when, I mean, there, there's some pretty serious and emotional stuff in that book. Um, so I, I didn't want it to be too heavy. Uh, I didn't, you know, I, I think my readers have a certain expectation of me. So in that case, what I did was there were a couple chapters that are purely historical. <clears throat> that are pretty funny. One has to do with the development of of stink bombs uh, in World War, starting in World War II, but um, going through very recent to very recent times. Uh, and then one on uh, the development, the navies and the OSS uh, spent a lot of time with working to develop a shark repellent, and uh, it didn't go very well. And it was hilarious. And I uh, somebody at the National Archives found me the actual, all the, the folders, the actual correspondence folders for that project. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So in that case, uh, but until I had those, um, I would sometimes struggle to try to figure out how, how is this, how is this going to feel like a Mary Roach book? I mean, and, and then not that, not that there's, not that it has to be funny, but I wanted that in the mix. So that was a bit of a, a writing challenge. And so that's similar also to fuzz. I mean, there's some, or animal vegetable criminal, as some people call it. Uh, there's some material in there that's that's quite heavy. But I, you know, to, so to to kind of blend those kind of con conflicting emotions and and sensibilities is a bit of a, <clears throat> a bit of a challenge. 
do you uh, do you get a chance to read mysteries or thrillers at all? Sometimes I do. Sometimes um, I don't read them that often, but uh, I've read. Um, there's a a guy named Brad. Oh my God, I'm forgetting his last name now. Um, Metzler. No, not Brad Metzler. I'm going to oh. see Brad Metzler uh, next week on, on Zoom. No, uh, Bradley Harper. He was a pathologist with the um, Armed Forces Medical Examiner, uh, AFMES, Armed Forces Medical Examiners, maybe Society, I don't forget. Anyway, he was a pathologist. He worked in um, the morgue at Dover, uh, and he was the one who encouraged yeah. me to write uh, Grunt, because I didn't think I'd be able to get access to a lot of places I wanted to go. As it turned out, the military was quite cooperative. Uh, but he wrote a series, he went on, uh, he, was in, he says I was his inspiration. He went on to write a, uh, a couple of mysteries um, that I read because you know he's, he's someone I know and they were quite good. He got some you know, new mystery writers award. Uh, Knife, in the, Knife in the Fog, maybe? It had to do with Jack the Ripper and, uh, it was, a, it was a twist on that. Anyway. Yeah, I uh, mentioned I, that Brad, Brad Harper was here in Indianapolis at, at Magna Cum Murder. And I don't know that if, if you knew that he and his wife portray Santa Claus and yes. in Williamsburg every year. I know that. He's, all, he's always sending me photographs. He's a very convincing Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed his book. And um um, I've read, yes, I've read a few. I, I, I tend to, I'm not a good mystery reader because I never figure out who, who did it. I'm always completely following the, you know, the red herring and the raw, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always wrong. Um, but I, but I enjoy, I sometimes watch, you know, like Knives Out, I watched. Uh, apparently, I, if it has knife in the title, I'll watch it or read it. Um, uh, and also, oh, oh, also another friend, uh, Judy Melanick, who is, a medical examiner and has a series uh what is uh, you know first cut final cut that has cut in the title again a knife on the cover um i read a couple of hers that i quite enjoyed uh the protagonist is hilarious I, her name isn't coming to mind so i do read them from time to time but i'm, I'm you know not a i'm a, i'm i dabble in many genres non-fiction well, and fiction well and this will apply to it anything you're you're reading but i i did a uh i've done a program a couple of times called it, the title we use is objection the law and fiction of film talking about uh, movies and and books that get the law right and some even very good movies that get the law entirely wrong do you ever watch anything or read something like that and you're just like cringing because they're getting the pathology, the science about anything, whether it's going yeah. to Mars or something else, uh, that they're just getting the science wrong or do you just let that roll off your shoulder? Uh, well, it definitely leaps out at me. I don't often notice it because I'm not, you know, I get just sort of caught up in the story and I'm not really watching with a critical eye, but every now and then something is so jarring. Um, like the, the one that comes to mind, and this is something I wrote about in Packing for Mars, there's a rumor, there was a rumor that there was a porno film that had been filmed on a, you know, zero gravity flight where they do the parabolic, you know, they take a plane and that roller coaster trajectory. The and vomit so, comet. Yeah, the vomit comet. Um, but you can do it with any, any plane really. Uh, and supposedly someone had done this. So I got hold, I downloaded the film, which is, it's a series called the Uranus trilogy or something. Anyway, they, it was so bad. They, they, you could tell people were just, you know, they stand, they were there, you couldn't see their feet. So they were, you know, pretending they're floating and they were just kind of going like this, but their hair wasn't floating. And, you know, it, not, it, I mean, it was so clearly not, even though the director, told me the whole story of how they paid somebody to do it. You know, just completely lied to me. And then I got the film and I'm like, you are so busted. That is, I mean, obviously it's a porno film. How much budget do you have? You're not gonna be able to do that, I don't think. Anyway, um, 
and the Martian was quite good. You know, there are a couple of things on the Martian that, you know, had to do with the atmosphere, but, uh, but, but it's, it's rare. I think the main, the main one is, and, and it's not something I know a ton about, but uh, when you see forensic shows where somebody has, you know, this screen where they're able to manipulate the image, you know, this fancy lighting system with a um, microphone built in, you know, I, I'm friends with them. Alameda County Medical Examiner. I've been to her morgue and it does not look like that. You know, it's just, you just, um, it's just kind of hilarious the way forensics, the glamour and glitz that is uh, supplied to um, what medical examiners do. And, you know, frequently they're working in a, you know, a facility that hasn't been updated in 30 years. And, you know, her computers were ancient and, you know, it's so, that's kind of hilarious to me. Um, also, the uh, the way that you know, cases will, you know, that, that how quickly things are resolved and how often it's done based on a single thread. And you know, you're like, first of all, it wouldn't happen that fast, and second of all, that's that's not going to be acceptable in a courtroom, or it shouldn't be. So that stuff, it, but it's it's entertaining for me. It doesn't it doesn't detract from my pleasure in those shows uh it's just it's just kind of funny i have a question from uh, uh bridget who uh is one of our officers uh has have you ever considered doing something on the history of weight and female body image and whether we are really obsessed with the perfect form or is it just peddled by modern media oh uh well i i think that that I think that ha that there is there are books. Um, there's a book by Laura Fraser called Losing It, and it is about that very topic. And I think that I mean that came out quite some time ago, but I think there have been some other prominent writers who who covered it. It's a good topic, um, uh, and I think especially now there are organizations that uh, fight fat shaming. Forget the name of that organization, but they've been quite vocal and, and are, you know, putting material out there. So I, I think that it's, you know, that, that that has been written about by people who probably are more qualified, but it's a good topic for sure. Um, so speaking of topics, what are you working on these days? Oh, another book. <laughs> uh, not really, uh, out there with the subject yet, just just getting rolling on it. Um, uh, sold it in the end of last year. Uh, COVID was a weird year; C couldn't really get rolling on anything. So, <clears throat> did a um, adaptation of Packing for Mars for middle grade readers for young readers. That was fun to do. That comes out next week. It's called Packing for Mars for Kids. <laughs> uh, uh, that was an interesting process, taking eighty thousand words bringing it down to 20,000 and then rewriting every one of those 20,000 words uh, for a, a younger sensibility, but also trying to you know, keep, the, keep some of the humor and the goofiness of it. So that was, that was fun to do. That's uh, helping with my Christmas list for next year for my grandkids. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, so uh, one more question, then if anybody has any questions, uh, I know we're getting up on the time here, but if anybody has any questions, just put them in chat and I'll see if I can get to them. Uh, when the, the, the first book, Back to Stiff, mm -hmm. when that first came out, and I, I did, I'm guessing from your comments, you had no expectations, maybe hopes, but no real expectations about what was gonna happen. What uh, what was your action? What was it like when the reviews started coming in and the sales started coming in and the reactions to this book started? Uh, just personally, how what was it like for you? Oh, it was well well stiff. Um, it didn't make the bestseller list right away in the way that um, you know when a book is given a big push <clears throat> and the publicists are really doing their job, um, you tend to make the list the first couple of weeks that the book is out because that's when all the yeah. reviews and the interviews and everything is going on. Stiff did not make the bestseller list 
It came out in April, it, it hit the list in August. <clears throat> and we had uh, so little interest in the book that we had to do the tour in two chunks. Uh, we couldn't get enough stuff in April. So we did another chunk in August. And I remember <clears throat> I was in a, either Boulder or Denver, Colorado uh, doing events and my agent called and said, you made the list. And I honestly had no clue what list he meant. I could have been the worst dressed list. It could have been, I don't know. I said, what list? And he said, the New York Times bestseller list. And I was just, because I had, like you said, I had no expectation. <clears throat> so I was flabbergasted. I was, it was so exciting. Um, I remember going to New York at uh, some point right around then and <clears throat> going out uh, to some place in New York near my publisher's office and having champagne with some people on the staff. It just, you know, it couldn't be happier. It was because it was, it's not like it was a lifetime dream, but it was such a surprise and so gratifying because you, you know, I was so worried about that book that nobody would A, buy it, B, read it, C, like it. Uh, I just, I mean, part of that is just my personality, uh, but it was so, everything just was, was so unexpected. And so, so for that reason, so exciting. So um, did you, or were you tempted to go back to your friend who at the party said, who's going to buy this <laughs> and share yeah. a copy? Um, um, yeah, you know, I, I did run it. She, she's somebody, she's an acquaintance more than a friend. And I think I, I may, I ran into her at some point. I think I may have mentioned that to her, or maybe it's just that I'm remembering my fantasies of <laughs> saying something to her. Uh, yeah, the book was, re Stiff was uh, re-released at the end of last year with a new cover and an epilogue kind of bringing things up to date. And on the cover, it says, one million copies sold. And I'm like, I really want to send a screen grab. Dear Bonnie, here's who's buying this book. <laughs> but I well, did. Uh, oh, you should. No, because um, no, she's right. Everybody thought that. It wasn't just her. True. I thought uh, that. The, uh, we have a question uh, from someone asking about in doing rewrites. So do you take a break when you're doing rewrites before you continue <clears throat> writing, or is it all done over a period of days, weeks? Do you mean, uh, <clears throat> sorry, rewrites that my editor has asked for, or or my rewriting my own work before I turn? I it think in? I think this is directed at your rewriting your own work. If you do, oh. Oh, you know what? I, I'm I uh, because we now have computers. I'm doing a million rewrites as I go along. You know what I mean? I've got a chapter <clears throat> mostly written. I'm going to go back and futz with this section, or maybe I'm going to fiddle with that section. So I'm doing it constantly. You know, instead I used to be. You know, when we people use typewriters, of course you had a draft, you mark it. You know, and then you do another draft. So I I, I think of it more as a thousand mini drafts that are constantly happening. Do you, do you have a, what's your writing schedule when you're working on a project and actually doing the writing? So do, are you a morning person? Do you write all day? Do you write two or three hours a day? Uh, yeah, I cannot write all day. I don't know. I don't know. Does anybody, does anybody actually write all day? Has that ever, well, anybody? You always, <laughs> you always I, write. I heard about Barbara Tuckman when he wrote Guns of August would go to her garage where her writing office was and would write from eight until five. And I have no idea how she would do that. I but don't either. That's I, the only I, person I'm, I've ever heard say that. I'm good for two, two or three hours. That is it. And I tend to do it in the afternoon <clears throat> because um, New York and the East Coast have shut down. So that cuts down on the emails and the interactions between you know, just there's there's less distraction. I often go to I have an office uh, that I should you know bunch of writers with little offices that are uh, downtown, not in my home. Uh, I, but I, 
don't always write there. I, I, I'll, if I really need to get writing done, I go to the, I go to a cafe that has a certain kind of music playing that and hubbub, and it just makes me focus. And uh, I never used to do that, but I, I now uh, find I'm very productive sitting in a, in a cafe, a busy cafe, which is completely different from how I used to work. Uh, I think you mentioned having a recorder earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and someone's asked this question about, do you use any type of specialized software like Scrivener, which is what I use. I, I love Scrivener or just a word processor or, you know, what's your writing process? contains transcripts of interviews that I've marked up with stars next to the stuff I'm going to uh, So I've got whatever, um, if there are journal articles, if there are um, just whatever material, um, photocopies from, from a book, whatever it is. So I've got that folder and I've kind of arranged it in an order that I think I'm going to use it, that changes all the time. And I, then it's just each chapter is a document. And um, toward the end, uh, I'll start combining, you know, there'll maybe a chunk of three in one document. And in the end, it's all in one document. So I don't use, uh, I don't use that Scrivener or any of those other uh, writing aids. Uh, just, it's a system that works for me and I don't like change. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we're a little after one. I thought if it's okay with you, I would ask if we have make one last call for any questions sure. uh, from people sure. in, in the group. Um, and uh, I think I asked you uh, about this in jest on the list I sent you of what I may ask about. But seriously, has there been any interest from anybody about, I mean, I've seen movies made of, well, Classically, Woody Harrelson or Woody Harrelson. Woody Allen made the movie "Everything You Always Want to Know About Sex," but we're afraid to ask. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Has, has anybody contacted you about any type of movie or or television rights to make something? Oh yeah, like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've uh, uh, all of my books have not all. Most of my books have been optioned some multiple times by various people. Um, and nothing ever came of it. I've been to numerous meetings in LA, which I always find entertaining because it's just such a different world to my world. Uh, and and uh, so people have, uh, the closest was a, <clears throat> a, um, a scripted show, you know, with characters uh, and that would be inspired by, not really based on Packing for Mars. And it was written by a team who did the Cleveland show or Family Guy, like one of those animated humorous shows. And it was very well done and very funny. And it made it all the way to the last round. And then someone at NBC, someone high up said, oh, I don't like shows about astronauts. And it got, it didn't get made. It was a very good pilot script. Uh, anyway, that's the closest. A lot of people have thought, oh, some sort of discovery show thing. But the problem there is that I'm so much a part of it and the things that I go and do Form the narratives and those have all been done so you you'd have to recreate it somehow um and nobody really came up with a, a, a good way to do that there was uh, one filmmaker vanessa roth who had a she does really good documentaries she had a plan uh charlize theron's production company and we pitched it and uh it was a i thought it, she she had a good take on how to do it this is for grunt <clears throat> but uh, nobody nobody ended up making it. So um, many options and no final product. Somebody asked, I think I already know the answer to this. Do options pay even if there are is nothing developed? Yeah, the option, yeah. for example- That's what would the be, option is. Yeah. yeah, the option is we, uh, we have the option to make something if we choose to for a period of time. Sometimes it's like only six months, maybe to be, in my case, it was like $5,000 for six months. I think is, I remember something being <clears throat> about that much. Um, uh, uh, but the, the amount of money is all over the map. You know, if there are people bidding, competing bids, it goes higher. Uh, I'm sure it can go lower. 
but it tended to be in the neighborhood of a few thousand dollars. And um, yeah, that, that's how it works. And, and then, no, so they're just basically saying dibs, you know, nobody else can touch this for six months because we're going to think about it and most likely not do it. <laughs> uh, well, we'll keep our, our fingers crossed for uh, Stiff the movie or Bonk the movie in, in a theater near us soon. <laughs> yeah, uh, someone wanted to do an opera based on Stiff, which I thought was a fine idea, but that never, that never happened. <laughs> oh, uh, there was a, a fringe theater show based on Bonk at the Edinburgh Fringe Theater. I didn't see it, but um, I gave them permission. So I don't know. I don't know what that was like, but they did it. Can I, I just want to, can I ask a really quick question? I'm just for keep sure. going back to keep going back to stiff. Um, and again, probably for our macabre interest in and in all things dead and how you get there. Um, when you're, yes. when, when you were researching this book, I mean, you were kind of going, you were talking about kind of doing like one chapter at a time. And um, did you kind of like sit back and say, I really, really think I need a chapter on, you know, uh, the body farm. Yeah, the body farm, or you know, crucifixion experiments, or um, <laughs> like, did you think? Well, I, you know, I need a, I need a chapter on, you know. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It's all based on um, what I, what I find and in, in many cases what I can get access to what I can go and observe say the body farm or somebody plastinating a body or a, <clears throat> a cadaver you know automotive impact test so I'm always looking for the narrative structure the scene that I'll be able to go and, and um, participate in or at least observe and so that determines what goes in <clears throat> um, in the case of historical material, it's it's just what what do I find that's interesting? Uh, you, you know, if if somebody said, "Oh, there was a guy who did this work trying to prove that the Shroud of Turin was real and he used cadavers," I would have been, "Yes, that has to be in the book," <clears throat> and I would have tracked it down. So in that, so you know, so sometimes, sometimes for sure, but for the most part, it's um, me just uh, uh, calling around and and asking people, what are you going to be doing? And can I come visit? And if they say yes, then that tends to be in the book. Thank you. Any more, yeah. any more questions? Listen, this has been just a stunningly wonderful program. <laughs> uh, just can't thank you enough, uh, Mary, for taking your time, for uh, sharing your experiences. Uh, for your sense of humor, and of course, for all, all of those wonderful books that you've written, and we can't wait to see the next one and what topic you're, you're working on. Wendy, you said you've already sold it, so uh, one last question, final thing. Yeah. You, you've just sold this, Yeah. so how, you don't do a lot of your research before you sell the book. Correct. So, What's the pro what's the arc? We talked about you talked about yeah. creative nonfiction and fiction having an arc. So what's the arc of the timeline from idea yeah. to sale to yeah. actual publication? Uh, well, I, I did for this one, I did a fair bit of research, uh, just making sure uh, that there was enough there. So so um, and calling around and and um, making sure that the things I wanted to do were possible. But the, it's, it, I give myself um, two, between two and two and a half years to, to do all the research and writing. Um, and and um, that assumes uh, we don't have another COVID mess come fall, you know, cause that will mean travel will be a problem. <laughs> The, and then it's another year out before you yeah. actually see the book in hand. Yes, and then it's, and then it's about a year out before the book is published yep so okay. yeah incredibly slow <laughs> listen it's it's been a joy and a pleasure and uh thank you so much and sure. uh, can't wait for your next book thank you so much Stephen, okay. and thanks to everybody for 
listening in. Uh, I really enjoyed it and good luck with your, with your writing, everyone. Thank you. Thank you All so right. much. Okay, take Bye. care.